David, it's very good indeed to be uh, talking to you. Um, I can remember for about five or six years when I was a member of the um, House of Lords facing you when you were on the Labour front bench. Um, anyway, it's very nice now to be having a, a much more relaxed uh, conversation. Um, but the links between the two of us, did we but know it, go back uh, quite a long way because we were both at Stationers Company School. Now, did you live near, the, fairly near the school? Yes, probably about a mile away. Uh, a nice brisk walk uh, every morning and every evening. And uh, I thought, I think I was very fortunate that it was such an enjoyable school that was that close. And, uh, and I did enjoy it. So did I. I'm very pleased. It was really my mother decided for me because I, I had one or two other ideas and she said, no, station is sort of good to me. And she wouldn't let me go to Enfield Grammar School because we lived in Enfield. I was part of what used to call the train gang. Right. Well, going down to get the train up, you know. Well, indeed. And, and later when we moved from uh, Crouch End up to uh, Winchmore Hill, I joined the train gang as well. And uh, I, I should just add, there's another parallel. It was my mother's decision as well. <laughs> and I, I remain completely grateful to her for that. Absolutely, yes. I was very pleased too. And so you, when you left Stations, um, you, had you, by the way, presumably, you're a great football enthusiast. Uh, did you play football at Stations? I did, I did uh, early on in the school, and then I played for various youth sides that were attached to, uh, to Spurs. And right. That kind of got in the way of playing uh, anywhere else. But uh, no, I, I, I enjoyed playing for the, the school in those early days. I think it was an opportunity to roll around in the mud in pitches that had never been <laughs> properly prepared. That's right. In Winchmore Hill, of course. But yes, in Winchmore Hill, indeed. In Winchmore Hill. And of course, during uh, the breaks, you could um, we all used to go out on the various terraces and uh, bang the book, uh, bang the ball against the wall. Yes, I, I, I used to convince myself it was to improve my skills, rather like Donald Bradman hitting a cricket ball with, or tennis ball, I think, with one stump against a wall and being able to do it for four hours without ever missing the ball. <coughs> However, I, I, my, my mind did not translate into skills anything like so good. Um, then you went from the state, did you go direct from station to the University of Essex? No, I worked for uh, a couple of years. Um, I, I did a, a couple of things. I think the thing I did longest was, uh, was my first little go at, at journalism. And uh, among other things, did some, um, did some of my writing for the then L London Evening Standard, now just the Evening Standard. Um, and that was that was very useful because it, it gave me an early sense of trying to express things in a brisk way because if you wrote more than a hundred words someone would just chop off the remaining bit and leave the hundred that you'd started with. Absolutely so uh, but then you did you went on to, to Essex to read uh, politics and economics? Yeah that's right and and, and it was some um, it was a great experience, uh, actually, Stephen. I, I, I found it a tremendous experience because the place was so new and so fresh that it was always possible to try things that you'd never really tried before. So I used to sneak into um, the English lectures and all sorts of uh, other things which I found enjoyable. And it was a bit of a relief from um, my... my preoccupation with the mathematical side of economics, which uh, I, I, I enjoy to this day, but I couldn't say it was the most creative thing in that sense. But what's interesting too is because you were there at a particular time um, of the uh, of university life. We, we've now become very conservative with a small C, probably with a big one too, but um, so that students seem to be all too um, docile. But you were there in the year that de Gaulle fell from power and the Frenchman took over the oil refineries and all the rest of it. What happened in Essex? Well, I think that the key thing that happened, uh, there, there, were, there were certainly students there who had issues with uh, what they thought uh, was 
less democracy in the university system than perhaps they'd expected from the brief lectures that had been uh, given by the uh, by Albert Sloman, who became the vice chancellor. But I think for a lot of people, and certainly for me, it was the Vietnam War. And it was the sense that uh, there were significant injustices and that uh, we should take some part in the protests about them. I have to say that um, it, it was uh, extraordinary to me because quite often it's small events that suddenly become the reason that a university or anywhere is in the headlines. Uh, there was a, a demonstration, for example, uh, against um, a scientist who'd come from Porton Down, uh, who'd been, as I understood it, responsible for developing uh, crop sprays that killed rice crops, which were plainly intended for, for Vietnam. And although there was an intention to interrupt the lecture and put this to him, not to stop him speaking altogether, uh, the police were called and the Colchester police arrived with police dogs that got loose. Total mayhem <laughs> broke out. Nobody could control the dogs. And suddenly this moved from being a rather small scale event to looking extremely dramatic. <laughs> but, but having said that, um, it really was about, uh, it was about Vietnam. But, you know, it also provided an interesting opportunity. It taught people to speak in public to learn how to publish journals magazines of all sorts of things which uh, which we learned as we went along and uh, and i've often thought that uh, it's sheer chance what you get a, an opportunity to learn just to make sure that the key thing is to make sure you keep learning very interestingly a friend of mine has just published a, a book it's his second book he works at the foreign office um on detente, that's the, the title is detente. And uh, of course it, it's mainly looking at Nixon's spell in the White House. Mm. And of course there is something very paradoxical about the fact that Nixon, who would not have come across for many people as the most attractive of politicians, and yet some of the really most good worthwhile things like the, um, the, the end of the war in Vietnam, um, and also the beginnings of better relations with uh, the Soviet Union, all, um, as it were, broke out at that time. It's an odd thing, that, isn't it? I think it is odd. Uh, on one or two occasions when, for example, the Israelis have moved closer to peaceful relations uh, and, and neighbourly relations with uh, the Palestinian community, it's often again been with very, very strong leaders, often with a military background. I think that there's, uh, there's a propensity uh, among the publics who are most concerned with this to trust people who they think will be very tough if they need to be tough. Doesn't make them very attractive, I think that's for sure, but but nonetheless tough when they, they need to be tough. And uh, to give them a little bit more latitude in a negotiation than they would otherwise have. When I was in the Foreign Office as a minister, uh, I, I seemed to be repeatedly sent to uh, war zones to try to negotiate with people who candidly you would have not wanted to spend 10 seconds with in normal life uh, as far as I was concerned they were for the most part in Duffour for example they were mass murderers but you you had a job to do to try to instill the idea of peace and I always thought that the key thing in doing that was to try to get them to see that there were there was more than one path that could be followed and one of them ended up disastrously and one of them ended up probably rather better than disastrously. I can't say they would have all ended up very well. But uh, there were a few occasions, uh, including with um, the now deposed leader of Sudan, where the thing that worked was being very candid and saying, you know, you don't lose your temper just by losing your temper in diplomacy. You, you decide what, what kind of mode you're going to be in but saying, I'm going to make sure you're tried at the Hague for war crimes. If I have one thing that I want to do in my life, it's to see you arraigned at the Hague. This usually meant that all the security people stood up and shuffled around wondering what was going to happen next. But I think that uh, there are occasions when you don't, you're not tough just to appear tough, but you're tough because you've got to a moment where something decisive has to be done and you have to be trusted that you will do what you've then said. 
very interesting, I think, because I, I, the, I was the nearest that you'd come to an ecclesiastical diplomat. I, yeah. I was the Archbishop's Foreign Secretary for Indeed. five and a half years. Um, and I think one of the things you learned was that, um, in a fairly subtle way, diplomacy didn't mean being nice to people. Quite, quite often it meant something very much the opposite of that. But, but if in the long run it, it was for the, for the, the greater good, then... Now then, you, you went on from there directly from, from Essex to Cambridge, and that was to, um, to do a doctorate. Mm. And that was again in the same sort of area. Yes, it was. It, it, it was. And um, by that stage, uh, I was more and more intrigued by one branch of applied maths. And I, what I really wanted to do was build models in, in maths, which might seem a, a very abstract uh, way of passing the time. But it was, it was, I think, both interesting and useful. I, I, I mean, I won't bore everybody with the kind of maths, but it's a branch of uh, probability maths, which was um, invented and extensively written on by the Reverend Bayes, who from his small parish, I think wrote 1400 research papers of incomparable brilliance, which uh, must say something about you guys. I think that's, uh, that's significant. And um, what it did do was not only give me uh, insights into economic method, but into methods which are used in um, making accurate, hopefully astute judgments about the probability of big events. Uh, so it's turned out to be remarkably useful. And when you'd finished that, you went on to teach in Cambridge at King's. Yes, first, uh, well, well the, the first uh, thing I did was continue to do research in the British Postgraduate Medical Federation, partly because I couldn't get any research money to carry on with economics modeling, but I could get lots of research money to model epidemics. And it was exactly the same maths. I mean, that was the, that was the uh, passport from one to the other. Uh, so I'd, I did that for a while and uh, was teaching uh, at Cambridge, but, but then um, moved to teaching in London as well. So my, my career sort of took off as an academic, but remarkably, as I look back on it, as an epidemiologist to start with, before I could find my way back into economics. Now, what I was dying to ask you is, have you read any of the novels of um, David Lodge? I have, yes. As I an do. academic, at least I find them huge fun just generally, but you must have found them fun as an academic. Yeah, yes, I did. And I, I think it's... Um, it's interesting because I don't think all that many books about um, academics and academic life are a lot of fun, are, are all that enjoyable to read. Um, but, but he certainly was very, very good. Funnily enough, I think there is some much, much more, not, not compared with David Lodge, but there's some, also some remarkably funny books about further education and the life in FE colleges, which is, uh, can be humorous. Equally good, yes. But I, I suppose, David, I, 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 the first thing I read was How Far Can You Go, which was yeah. really out of his experience as a Roman Catholic um, undergraduate with a church that was per perfectly impossible before Vatican II and uh, which managed to transform itself to become perfectly impossible in a different way after Vatican II. But then, of course, we got on to the wonderful things about things like um, Small World and so on. Mm. on the university campus okay so then when did you i mean one of the other things now i need to preface this very carefully i've just finished reading one of about 15 books i've been given for christmas and i've chosen things that i thought would be easy reading first so i chose um the autobiography by arsene wenger now i realize i'm on dangerous territory here speaking to a tottenham man but um, I found it a good read, and he came across as a humane person, intelligent, but with an extraordinary single-minded passion for football. I think that's accurate. accurate. One, of my, um, one of my great treats in the period when I've been more heavily involved in football was to get to know Arsene Wenger. And uh, also Ivan Gazidis, who was also at the Arsenal, another very 
interesting man. But, but Arsene Wenger is an exceptional man. He has all the qualities that you described. I think he's got a very deep and penetrating mind. But one of the things I really liked about him and like about him was that on occasions that um, you th that any of us wanted to do things uh, on the anti-racism front or on the um, tolerance towards people with different sexualities or whatever, you could always guarantee that he would take part in it. He'd always make a public appearance. So for example, um, I helped organize something I'd really, really wanted to do for a long time, um, an, an exhibition at the Jewish Museum in London uh, on Jewish people in football. Now, a number of people just didn't want to take part at all because they thought that um, they would be seen as, uh, as being wealthy or controlling the game or all the kind of uh, nasty sorts of things that get said. But the first person who said, yeah, I want to be there at the opening and open it was Arsene. And I thought, great, absolutely great. It wasn't just that he was approached and he said, yes, he was really proactive. He thought it was right. Yes, I think he's a, uh, that, that comes across in the book and uh, he's a very sort of uh, attractive human being. Um, I really met him in passing because I had a, we had a great link with the Tanzanian diocese and believe it or not, the Tanzanian bishop was, was an Arsenal fan. And oh. I managed, I persuaded the chairman to uh, invite us to lunch before the match and um, we met Wenger and there's a, marvellous picture in uh, Omindo's house in uh, Musoma in Tanzania of him sitting on one side of Venga with me on the other side and I said oh they must be so proud of you and he said no no he said they think it's all been just you know it's been touched up you know by electronics and I wasn't there at all so yeah you were um, chairman of the FA I was, yes. I was the first um, independent chairman, somebody who had not been drawn from one of the football counties or whatever. Um, curiously, uh, it, it was a job that I relished doing, partly because I think there were a number of things that you could change to some extent in English football. You could try to make sure that the uh, largest and most prosperous part of it made some kind of financial contribution that was worth having to the smaller and more insecure parts. That's turned out with COVID to have been something that it'd been great if we had got it right at the time, but we didn't really. Um, the big clubs are never too keen to give up uh, any of their wealth. Uh, I wanted to do lots of stuff on women's football and that's uh, that's a fabulous game and it's it's growth is all over the world it's growth is tremendous there was some resistance to that but i also wanted to see a number of other initiatives including disability football and so on and, and i have to say that broadly speaking the things that were done in england because of course the football association is just english not scottish or welsh or uh, northern irish it's uh, it's a, just an english organization um, a number of the things that um, we did I thought were worthwhile. The difficult thing was the international organisations because, you know, I, I, you may have heard me say it in, in the House, but uh, deeply, they have been deeply, deeply corrupt. And so getting anything, uh, anything done is very difficult. I was once told by people that I should never raise these questions. It was rude to the football family and I ended up saying, I don't know that they're certainly a family, but they're not a football family. They're a mafia family. Yeah, and of course now Wenger is working for Ty for himself, isn't he? Let, we must move on to to, to politics. I'll, I'll never be forgiven if I don't get get through to now. Now you were in the prime minister's office in the um, early part of the twenty first century, I think. Yes, I was. I. I was the general secretary of the Labour Party but ran the political machine and uh, so I spent a lot of time in number 10 and uh, that was uh, that was very instructive. It's very strange you know people get an impression of, uh, of political leaders like Tony Blair uh, which are often it's not surprising but often great great variance to what you experience. I mean people have described him, I know, as um, as being uh, very control freaky, 
But one of the things I found about him, really from the day that I started working with him, I mean, I knew him through the creation of New Labour, but mm. when I was uh, actually working with him, was that if anybody came in and just said, yes, Tony, or yes, Prime Minister, he would get bored in 30 seconds. He wanted an argument. It may be because he always thought he'd win them, but I mean, he, he, he just <laughs> had an argument. He, had, he loved having people around him who would really argue. And he always made the point, which is a point Jeffrey Howe on the conservative side used to make to me as well. If you didn't have a really good argument about things, you rarely got to the bottom of them. You rarely saw all the nuances. Uh, well, you'll have seen this as a as a, a, a diplomat in the Archbishop's office as well. You, you've got to work your way through things and not leave them to chance. And I've always felt that, I mean, I, I, I ran a cathedral in Norwich and I then ran a diocese in Yorkshire. And one of the things that I, I thought was really important was to make sure that the people you had working with you, in which you had some opportunity to help choose, uh, weren't always people who agreed with you. Absolutely. I think that um, I think that it, you, you kind of learn you, you learn a lot of things in these processes of working with large groups of people, particularly if you're uh, at the head of an organisation. The first is to choose people who aren't going to agree with you. That's absolutely true. The second is to persuade them to pause and think about what each other is saying. I always thought that the email was a, t a disaster because people would normally have waited 24 hours before they wrote a letter back to somebody and they'd have probably thought hard during those 24 hours. So I had a rule inside the uh, party's head office that I didn't want anybody who worked there emailing each other. Well, of course they did, but I mean, I didn't really want it. I wanted them to have a discussion. I wanted them, if they wanted to write things down, to pause and think about it because being in listening mode is one thing, but if you don't actually then stop and think about what the other person has said, it wasn't to much purpose. So um, I, I, I'm, um, I, I think it is, it is one of those opportunities to learn from other people and uh, give yourself the time to do that. Well, one of my, uh, I suppose you call it an Episcopal hero, was John Habgood, who was Archbishop of York. Mm. And he used to say to me quite often, he said he developed a thing which he called the principle of studied neglect. <laughs> I like it. That's very good. He put something on one side and come back to it in two or three days. And he knew that he was likely to get a better and more sensible response from himself that he would have done, as you say, jumping on to a reply to an email. And then we, we're now um, at stations, as it were. That's, that's why we're here today. Um, and uh, Brenda Dean, bless her, who I was a great fan of, was your sponsor, I think. She was, and we shared an office um, with Dennis Healy. In, oh, uh, gosh. In well, he didn't come in all that often because uh, his health was failing a bit toward the end. But um, with, with Dennis and, and um, one or two other people, because as you probably will remember, we all kind of packed in like sardines in the building. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Brenda was uh, a quite remarkable woman, and I think that um, she, and I'd like to say I think me as well, uh, were always on the progressive side of politics, always wanted to see if we could help foster change, but also, uh, let me just say it of Brenda, had huge respect for many of the institutions in the country for the country itself. Um, I, I was uh, told when I arrived at the Foreign Office by a, a CIA um, senior person that uh, they knew I must be all right really because I was such a passionate supporter of English football. I must be, I must be um, a patriot of some sort. And I, 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 but Brenda was, I mean, she had those virtues in, in uh, ACEs. Well, yes, and it's interesting. I think one of the things that most attracted me, one of the good things about the House of Lords for all of its quirkiness and oddness in many ways, is that there seemed to be much more commerce across the boundaries of parties and cross benches. So you had lots of friendships that crossed all those barriers. And that I found attractive because it, it seemed to me to, to have a much greater sense of reason running through it. We better pack up in a minute or I shall be in trouble for, um, you know, taking, keeping people for too long, including you. But 
Just one last thing. I mean, you've been um, chairing the fundraising committee and so on recently, but if someone said to you, what, what would you like to see uh, if, about stationers that um, could be more exciting for the future, particularly at this rather uh, crucial moment with the war being done, what, what would be your reflection? Well, the, the thing that I really, really love is that uh, making reading available to vast numbers of people, publishing, editing, thinking the thing through, writing, all of those things are the absolute bedrock of democracy. And I sometimes wonder whether young people uh, or older people maybe uh, understand where the process of democracy comes from. Now, I think it was born in those buildings because after all, they started in a pre-democratic age, really, but they were born in those buildings. And I think the many of the ways to reach out to people from the stations are about the most fundamental gift that you can give in a free society. Well, there, there are two. The rule of law is the other one, actually, I would say. Um, you know, other things, uh, you obviously come from a very great faith tradition. I'm becoming more increasingly more Jewish as I grow older. We all have, we all have these things, but, but as a country and as a society, our bedrock is the rule of law and democratic process. And they flow from the written word and the study of the written word and its availability. And if we could locate ourselves in that kind of way, I think people will be flooding through our doors from every school to see where it was born. I don't think we could stop on a better note. That's just fantastic. And it's been uh, a joy to uh, have this conversation with an old stationer, as we both are, and also someone who worked for at least a shortage time alongside you and, uh, and many others um, in Parliament. David, thank you very much indeed for your time. I've enjoyed it enormously. Thank you very much.